Welcome back everybody. I really appreciate having you here. You might actually think if you've been watching my channel a while now, um, thank you very much for sticking around and watching my videos. I appreciate it. And if you're new here, I first of all want to put a disclaimer out that this video came about because in my head I'm going, why am I doing well with species and novelty hybrids as opposed to not so well with a complex hybrid phalaenopsis. So my head has been going and going and I just thought, you know what? I'm going to voice my thoughts here with one as opposed to the other and see if there are any correlations that you might have, which you could also then bring into the discussion conversation in the comments section. And maybe more questions will trigger another video. But I have been so frustrated for so long that here are my, on the left are my species or novelty phalaenopsis. And then here on the right, not all of them, just examples are the complex hybrids that you find in your big box stores or your local garden center or your supermarket. And I can say that I have not lost a single species or novelty hybrid phalaenopsis. But in the last three years, I've lost at least eight of the complex hybrids. And that is so frustrating because my complex hybrids are mainly gifts and memories. I buy the species because I like the color, I like the fragrance, and I like the leaves. If I lose one, that's up to me. I've lost some money, I made a mistake, I might replace it, I might not. But when it comes to the complex hybrids, they are gifts, they mean a lot. And it pains me to lose them. So I've been doing a lot, a lot of comparisons. And that's what I'm going to share with you today. And maybe I can come to a conclusion and maybe it resonates with you. So this is more of a chitty chatty video. Let's get into it because for the first thing I would like to say what attracted me to the species were the blooms the color variation, the shape variation, and the fragrance. You don't get that fragrance with complex hybrids, very, very rarely. I'm in Southern Spain and we don't have these different kind of phalaenopsis on our shelves like you would see elsewhere in the world that are now, the complex hybrids are now also coming out with fragrance. I only was lucky with one when I bought it, that was just pure luck, and it was fragrant, and I lost it. It was so annoying. But um, the fragrance attracted me to the species and the blooms. So th those are the two things that made me go, okay, I'm going to go for species cells. I'm going to risk it, because at the time, I thought they would behave and be just as complicated for me as these complex hybrids. So there's that. I'm going to add some pictures to show you the variety of blooms from one versus the other. Another thing about the species was the leaves. I love the light green leaves. I love mottled leaves. And sometimes a complex hybrid will show up and has some traits of mottling, but that's because of the parentage. I don't know if you can pick that up but there is some shades and signs of mottling in there. Not much, but it can happen. So there is that attraction. I loved the lime green. I also like the fact that they are summer bloomers as opposed to the complex hybrids. They bloom in the winter. And when I was building my collection, I was looking for a variety of orchids to grow that would provide me with blooms all year round. I would never be without blooms. So I know that the complex hybrids start to spike in winter and then early, early spring, late winter, early spring, there's blooms, an abundance of blooms. And then they fade and start their vegetative growth. And then I would get my summer bloomers to bloom. So I filled the gap. So on one hand, we have these blooming in the summer. That's why they're also known as summer bloomers. If you're not going to refer to a species, it's a summer blooming fowl and everybody kind of knows, ah, a novelty hybrid or a species. And the complex hybrids, they normally bloom winter, late winter, early spring. 
So I covered two seasons. I also like the fact that in winter, when nothing else much is in bloom, there's a bloom count on the complex hybrids that is phenomenal on this long, long spikes that you do not get on the summer bloomers. So when space is an issue, the complex hybrids go into vegetative growth. The bloom spikes are gone and they're doing something else and getting ready to be able to spike again in the fall when the temperatures drop. But the summer bloomers, when space is an issue for me indoors, I don't have to worry about blooms because that is when they are starting to push out their foliage. So when they finish blooming, that's when they start producing their leaves. So these are polar opposites of their behavior. Also, proof in the pudding is their light requirements. You can see how light this one is. That is my Zengmin giraffe. And then you see how dark the foliage is on the complex hybrids. And that tells you something as well. The summer bloomers need a lot more light in order to thrive and bloom as opposed to the complex hybrids. They don't need any direct sun. I'm not saying that all novelty hybrids or species need direct sun. You can see I've made a mistake here with sunburn and that was me being careless because I thought, oh, they need more light, but I didn't factor in what time of day. The color of the leaves will show you exactly how much light they need. Summer bloomers highlight and the complex hybrids do not need a lot of light to bloom. The complex hybrids need a temperature drop. That's it. In order for them to spike, they just need a temperature drop. I'm not saying put them in a dark cupboard, but I'm doing a comparison between why is one working and the others sometimes just take off and go to orchid heaven for me. And it's always the complex hybrids. So these are sort of my troubleshooting thoughts in my head that I'm verbalizing here. The care requirements, one versus the other, are pretty much the same. If in active growth, fertilize. If in bloom, fertilize. So basically these switch and swap themselves around because in the summer, I have my summer bloomers in bloom, they get fertilized. I have my complex hybrids in active growth, they get fertilized. So there's that. There's no real difference there at all. My complex hybrids are now getting a higher amount of fertilizer than my summer bloomers. They are now going up to 400 parts per million just because I want the structures to grow big and strong and healthy, like this one. That is a gorgeous new leaf coming there on the left. And that is what I'm looking for as opposed to the previous years. The leaves are stunted and that is also acclimatizing issues, which is a great segue for me. Acclimatization. I grow in Lekka and self-watering. That is my preferred method. I very, very rarely deviate away from that simply because I don't want to have a collection of orchids, ones like this and ones like that. I vary on the pots depending on the likes of the orchid, but it's Lekka and self-watering that I'm trying to get everybody accustomed to. It makes my life much, much easier. So here is a good segue with regards to acclimatization. I have found the complex hybrids to be extremely difficult in my environment with the Lekka to acclimatize to this self-watering setup. I do not have a wet-dry cycle. For them, they normally, you hear in books, prefer a wet-dry cycle. Well, I'm not doing that, not with these, not with my cattleyas, not with any, not, normally not with any of my orchids. I have found the acclimatization into this setup much more complicated, regardless of time of year. I have tried time of year, active growth, not active growth, and I have also tried to just ignore all the rules and get them out of their dirty media and straight into the pots, acclimatizing the roots gradually by keeping them moist longer, giving them a calcium and seaweed bath before transplanting. You name it, I've tried it. 
in order to get these established and accustomed to the new setup. Versus my summer bloomers. No problem. Nothing. They dumped into this setup from their sphagnum moss nursery pot and we never look back. I have not lost a single species or novelty phalaenopsis by transferring them whenever, whenever. I didn't wait for active growth. I got them out of the nursery pot. I put them in there and off they went. Never an issue. So that is where I come to the conclusion that even though the complex phalaenopsis have much higher demand when it comes to them growing, they do not like to have their roots as disturbed, in my opinion, as for example, the species. You disturb the roots and you give them enough water, they will thank you for it. They grow, for example, like weeds, not that any orchid grows like a weed, but these species they do. And why? In my opinion, because they haven't been messed with. They come, they are who they are, you can look them up or not look them up, and you just see what media they come in, you replicate that, whether you want to grow inorganic or organic, it doesn't matter. But if it comes in sphagnum moss, it likes a lot of water. If you can provide that with your repotting, no matter if you use organic or inorganic, they'll love you, they'll take off. And you know what you're up against. The complex hybrids, it says it in the word. They are complex hybrids. And complex means there's a lot of mixture gone in there. Whatever they came from initially, it's all been bred out. It's all about the blooms, be it the size of the blooms, how much the spike branches, be it the bloom count, longevity, whatever. The reason is they are complex. So in my conclusion, I'm not making excuses because I am still, you know, kind of fascinated in a negative sense as to why I've lost so many and have had to struggle in getting the ones I do have established and you saw by the size of the leaves. The acclimatization is much longer with the complex hybrids than it is with the summer bloomers or the species. There is not so much going on here by way of mixing and matching. If you get a species, it's a species. It says what it says on the tin. There is no messing about. So they have their attributes. You can provide for the attributes. They'll take off. The Schilleriana over here. It's a Schilleriana. It needs a lot of water it, when it's growing, when it's about to bloom. We know the energy that the spike takes to create. And then you accommodate that and you're not messing around with what else is going on in the heritage. If we want to say one versus the other, I will always, always be happy to buy a species. I am always, always very hesitant and apprehensive if somebody brings me a Phalaenopsis complex hybrid and gives it to me as a gift. Now that is my, that's just me thinking, oh no, I don't want to lose another one. And I, I, I hate losing gifts, I just do. So I just thought that I would touch up upon how the species behave regarding their spikes as opposed to the complex hybrids. There's also varied opinions with regards to keeping the spikes on the complex hybrids, letting them branch, letting them extend their tip and continuously bloom. And I would say that just entirely depends on the health of your orchid. Mine, I wanted them to establish more vegetative growth. So winter of 2018, I had a wonderful show of all my complex hybrids. It was everything that was established and doing well, spectacular. I loved it and I thought I had nailed it. And then the vegetative growth started and well, this is the extent of the leaf. And on the other side, it didn't get much bigger. So I made a decision in the winter of 2019. I want more growth. I want it quicker and earlier in the season than I did for the 2018-2019 season. And the longer you leave a spike on, 
the more energy will go into the blooming as opposed to any kind of vegetative growth. So, you know, if your blooms last for four or five months, as these complex hybrids do, then by May, maybe May, if you're lucky, or if your blooms are lasting, by the time those blooms fade, the orchid goes into rest mode. It doesn't do anything for maybe four weeks, five weeks until it decides to either do roots or another leaf. And I didn't want to leave it that long extended into this growing season this time around. So in my the winter of 2019 leading through to 2020, I cut off approximately 13 spikes of my complex hybrids because I wanted to trigger growth sooner so they have a longer period of time in order to do that. Um, this is my big white fowl called Maximilian. It's working. This was the first leaf. Very slowly started. Now I have a second one and it's already bigger than the first one of this year. And it's starting to grow roots in the back, heading down into the pot, just like I want it. And we are now in August. So last year, I never gave them this opportunity for this long. Am I going to do this every year? No, no. I am hoping that by the end of this growing season, my complex hybrids that I have left are so well established that I can let them spike again. And then we will observe what they do by spring, early summer next year. But right now, so far, cutting the spikes was extremely painful, but I'm getting the results I was hoping for. Bigger, bigger structures, and more roots growing sooner in the season before temperatures drop and then the orchid goes whoops I need to flower and it stops everything it's doing and starts to push spikes. That's one thing that I do like is the flower count, the size of the flowers, the longevity. Of course you can get small phalaenopsis that are the complex hybrids as well. Here's one and she's a little white one and she's called Maxi even though she's little. And she was so well established in her pot, I let her bloom. And only now is she starting to grow a leaf. We are in mid-August. So if I want two spikes out of her again next year, look, the leaf on the right, that developed last year through the winter. And then she dropped everything she was doing and started to spike. Mid-August now, I am having my first leaf develop and she has until about October, November to develop another leaf in order to bloom again next year. I find that extremely late in the season, but okay, she's a little one. She's super well established. She's solid in her pot and growing aerial roots and uh, doesn't think twice about lecker and self-watering, loves it. But you see what I meant about the structures. They stop growing when she thinks it's time to spike. So I want leaves to go back to the same size as the one on the right there. And if that doesn't happen, this growing season, I'm going to take off her spikes in the winter because I've enjoyed her. So I can, you know, one year on, one year off and switch them around a little bit so it's not so painful. They do like light, but the sun is coming over there. And we, I'm just switching them around a little bit so that I don't burn anybody. Another thing that I do like, and there's a good difference in comparison here as well, that they develop keikis on their spikes. So I had this one grow, and it's only just now starting to get established in my preferred setup. This one, this little keiki is a year old. So that is cool, but the species are not to be outdone. Except in my case, my species develops little plants around the bottom, making it a bushier plant. Now, a complex hybrid will do that as well, but usually that's a sign of stress and it, that the mother plant is going to die off. When I saw the keiki on my big white fowl, I thought, oops, there's a problem. That's why she's throwing out a keiki. It's not necessarily always the case. It could be. And that is the confusing part between a species novelty hybrid as opposed to a complex hybrid is that the novelty hybrids or the species just grow plants at random around the side not an issue it's what they do you know where you're at with them 
the complex hybrids. If you see a cake on a spike, make sure that you've got a healthy orchid, then she's doing what she's doing. Great, you have another replica of your plant. But if there's a possible signs that something's wrong, that is when they'll throw out another plant in order to survive. The roots. The difference between the roots, not much, except that the roots, in the case of a species or a novelty phalaenopsis, they're a little bit whiter, a little bit more silver, and in my observations with many of them, a lot more robust to the touch. They, but they break easily. Whereas a complex hybrid, you can see that they are fleshy, but they almost look like plastic. So the bizarre situation with my, in my head, trying to compare my culture and why is one working, not the other. Well, I would have thought that these little, these roots here that have are more susceptible and a little bit more finer and softer. They're, they're, there's a sort of fragility about them that they would not appreciate the constant wet environment. But on the contrary, they love it. And that's, that for me makes them so easy to deal with. Whereas with the complex hybrids, you just don't know. You just don't know. And, or let's say, I don't know. I don't know if this one's going to be good or if the stronger root in the back here is going to be good in this setup. For me, it's a guessing game. So complex hybrids versus species or novelty hybrids, for me, I will always, always feel super comfortable, happy. I understand the species. I know what's going on. There's no faffing around with regards to where did you come from? What's in your makeup? You just know they like it warm and they like it wet and they're ready to go. The bloom count is not as much, but it certainly is very interesting and makes a nice replacement. Also, if you have space issues, they'll show up maybe in clusters of three, two or even just one at a time but that is also because they are so long lasting and they permeate a fragrance which requires a lot of energy so you will not get this massive long cascade of blooms but what you will get is sequential blooming one after the other so you also have a spike looking different they're not as long and spindly they are here in this case flat flat and thick not round as you can see, the sun is now coming over to this side of my shelf. And that is not a problem for the species or the novelty hybrids. Now, some may say there are deficiencies and some may say there is not a deficiency. And you might be right. I would say this one is a little bit deficient on the magnesium front because it's pushed so much energy into building the new little plants. But it'll recover. It's just a question of time. I'm not going to pump it full of magnesium. That's ridiculous. I use Emma's U fertilizer. It'll take its time and it'll distribute things. But the real difference in leaf color here, this one hasn't had as much light as this one. The more light you give your species, the lighter the leaves will become as well. This one has only just recently been moved outdoors because I've had it in bloom. I've kept it inside to enjoy the fragrance and I didn't want to break any blooms. I didn't want any bud blast. That's another thing the two of them actually do have in common, bud blast, a draft, cold temperatures, an open window. You move it from one location to the next, boom, you'll get some bud blast in 80% of the cases, not all the time. But these are the things in my head that I've been contemplating. Why am I doing so well with the species? versus the complex hybrids. My conclusion is the species is the species. There is nothing mixed in. It's pure. There's no confusion. And you know what you're up against. You start mixing and matching certain things, not only in Phalaenopsis, but in any kind of orchid. Then you have, you can get a cold grower becoming intermediate, but the hot growing side of the parent doesn't like intermediate and it becomes a bit messy and then they are deemed as fussy and they're not, they're not fussy. It's trying, it's me trying to get them to grow the way I want them to. And I, and honestly, I do wonder sometimes whether bark is best. I do, I have to. I have to think about these options as well, but I, I will not go back to an organic growing method. I want to get away from that. And whoever stays with me, 
whether it be a complex hybrid versus a novelty hybrid, they are very welcome and I will keep trying to figure out why one just works well for me as opposed to the others. And my conclusion in the meantime was, as I mentioned, the species, you know what you're up against. The complex hybrids, it's what it actually says in the word. They're complex. And I admire, respect, and envy everybody that says complex hybrids are so easy to grow. You have my utmost respect because I find them a challenge. This was my little comparison, my little model thought, trying to put into words my troubleshooting about why do the species and the supposedly difficult Phalaenopsis to grow do well for me and the supposedly easy Phalaenopsis do not do well for me. The complex hybrids. At this point, those are my comparisons. I'm dealing with a simple format. I know what I'm doing. I'm dealing with a complex format. I don't know what's going on in there. I just hope for the best and just keep trying. So thank you very, very much everybody for joining me on this little chit chat. Um, just wanted to run my thoughts through and verbalize them. Now when I go to edit it, maybe it doesn't make any sense at all. But I would like your opinion as to what I have just said, whether there are some pointers or there are, it's just me rambling away in my head, not coming to any conclusions. But I think that's pretty much why I do well with one and not the other. Thank you everybody so much for listening and share your thoughts in the comments below. I really appreciate it. I hope you have a wonderful day. Take care. Bye.